head teachers consult, doctors consult, nurses consult, but that's based on expertise that they have. I consult based on the expertise I have gathered being an academic for 10 years. Did Deloitte have expertise in test and trace? Uh-uh. <laughs> so it's actually not rocket science that I went wrong. Did the NHS, through a decentralized network of GP practices, have expertise on health? Yes. <laughs> Is it surprising that they did quite well? in terms of the vaccine rollout in the UK, no. So the intergovernmental approach that you need to fight a COVID pandemic, where we had the COVID war rooms with ministers from all over working together, we should normalize that. The Pope, who I met this, uh, I even have a picture. Oh, look at it on Twitter, I just tweeted it. He was reading Russian Economy on Monday. Dominic Cummings brought me into Downing Street before he, you know, before all that blew up, uh, saying, love your book. <laughs> and I was like, well, if you do, you got to stop talking the way you do, because to be honest, you got some issues there. I mean, his thing was like, like, oh, we need geeks in government. I was like, you think NASA attracted the people they did? The average age was 26 years old in mission control rooms saying, oh, we need geeks. No, <laughs> we didn't just have the weekend come down from heaven or, or from governments. People fought for the weekend. People fought to have vacation. People fought to not have kids working in factories. And that just gives me hope because it makes us remember that there's agency. There's nothing that's inevitable. Even those you know, $6 trillion of uh, share buybacks that we've seen in the corporate sector, that's not inevitable, that's fruit of a decision. So that means that strategy matters. Mariana Matsukato, hello, how are you? Hello, very happy to be here. I'm fine. Very glad to have you. Um, we are here to talk about the big con, your delightful term here, out today. Yes available everywhere, um, the consulting industry, we, how the consulting industry weakens our businesses, infantilizes our government and warps our economies. Before we get into that, and there's a lot to discuss, yeah. tell us who you are in your own words. So I'm Mariana Mazzucato, uh, born in Italy, grew up in America, I've been in the UK for 22 years, and I'm a professor in the economics of innovation and public value at University College London, where I founded and direct an institute which is all about rethinking the state. It's called the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Let's start then with an absurdly broad question. What is wrong with our economic system? So first of all, first of all, the economic system is not deterministic. It's an outcome, outcome of all sorts of decisions we make. And so we've been making the wrong decisions. It's an outcome of how we govern and organize the public sector. There's different ways to do that how we govern and organize the private sector, and how we govern and organize the interrelationship between them. But also, of course, there's other types of sectors, organizations, in the third sector and civil society. So my work now for 20 years has been talking about how we've misgoverned the public sector. At best, we talk about it as fixing market failures. So there's a whole theory behind that in economics. It informs the treasuries, the ministries of finance around the world, austerity, but even the counter to austerity is still framed within a very narrow way of thinking about government. Private sector, since the 1980s, has basically been convinced that at best it can maximize shareholder value. So over six trillion dollars have been, that's 12 zeros, just in case you forgot, uh, <laughs> um, has been used just to buy back shares by the large corporates to boost stock prices, stock options, and executive pay. And the relationship between these two, just like any relationship, the word relationship is not necessarily a good thing. It's just, you're in a relationship. Is it a good one or a bad one? You know, don't want to know about your private life, but you know, that too is not deterministic. So the ecosystem between these two is very problematic. An ecosystem from a biological point of view could be mutualistic, could be symbiotic, it could also be parasitic, it could be predator prey. So I think we have a parasitic, problematic relationship between public and private. So all those three things, governing the public sector wrongly, always reactive, too little, too late, because you're fixing failures versus proactively shaping an economy to be inclusive, sustainable, maximizing shareholder value, which means that we have an ultra-financialized private sector, and a parasitic relationship between them, we got a mess. I'd like if we have time to get into that increasing financialization, but yeah. let's talk about consultancy. I'm guessing the way you see consultants slotting into those sort of three areas, it's the, it's the third area, that parasitic relationship that you're kind of categorizing. Well, absolutely. They are in the middle of that relationship. Uh, so um, I was going to make a joke, but I won't. Um, so, <laughs> I always have to be careful with jokes on when there's a video. Um, we actually talk just as much about the first bit, which is if you are at best fixing market failures, we have designed so by design, we are not only in reactive mode, 
but in kind of inertial mode. There's no real incentive to invest within your capacity and your capabilities if you're just basically regulating, administering, fixing, enabling, de-risking the cool risk takers in the private sector. And you will stop investing in your own brain because you're not really there at the center of the system. You're just kind of you know, guiding what others are doing. And so all of a sudden, a door is opened for the value creators to come in and tell you what to do. And it's not just about consulting. I've written plenty about how we have a problematic private public and how the private sector and privatization and outsourcing more generally has happened. I wrote a book called The Value of Everything about that. This is a very specific book, which, by the way, I wrote with my PhD student, Rosie Collington. She's absolutely wonderful. It's been a huge pleasure to be co-authoring this book together. Um, and it's very much actually a byproduct of the institute, again, where she's doing her PhD that I set up five years ago, which is all about why do we just talk about like creativity and dynamic capabilities in the private sector? What would that look like in the public sector? And what we talk about in the book is that this ultra consultification of our economy, where you have the McKinsey's and the Deloitte's at the center of the system, not advising on the sidelines, at the center doing some of the most important things like climate strategy for Australia, test and trace COVID-19 in the UK was done by Deloitte. That's pretty central during a health pandemic. Then we have a problem. Uh, first of all, it's representative of the fact that we have stopped investing in the capacity in the, private, in the public sector, so they require all this you know, help outside. But also, when there is a conflict of interest in terms of the contract, we've got even a greater problem. When there's lack of transparency in those contracts, even a greater problem. And um, yeah, so I'll shut up so you can ask me another question. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and you're right. There's almost an incentive as well for the consultants to rather than upskilling the public sector because obviously it reduces the longevity of their, their contracts, right? Well, yeah. I mean, for example, I'm an academic and like most academics around the world, we're trying to, you know, do good for the world. So we consult, you know, my institute consults, but our, our incentive, our end game is that the government that we're working with doesn't need us in the next round. Uh, our business is not consulting. The book is about the business model behind the consulting industry. Head teachers consult, doctors consult, nurses consult, but that's based on expertise that they have. I consult based on the expertise I have gathered being an academic for 10 years or so. I've been writing about specific issues like an industrial strategy. I might go try to help a a government do that. What we talk about in the book, and we call it consultology, <laughs> is that there's a bit of hand waving going on, you know, a bit of like copy and paste, like PowerPoint presentations that are um, pretty vague uh, and don't actually represent real expertise in the area. Did Deloitte have expertise in test and trace? Uh-uh. <laughs> so it's actually not rocket science that I went wrong. Did the NHS, through a decentralized network of GP practices, have expertise on health? Yes. <laughs> Is it surprising that they did quite well in terms of the vaccine rollout in the UK? No. I mean, first of all, it wasn't perfect. Nothing is perfect. It's, it's never about good versus bad, perfect versus imperfection. It's about the incentives. Why are we actually hiring in, as consultants, agencies, organizations that actually have no expertise in that area that they're consulting in. And the answer we give, because this also happens in the private sector, by the way, there's many businesses bringing in consultants to rubber stamp certain decisions. And that we call cowardly, basically. In fact, we don't use that word. The next version, I'll make sure we insert that word. Because you know, own up to your decisions. If you're going to downsize and fire a lot of workers, if you're going to make the decision like Pfizer has for many years, I often tell my husband if I don't come home at night, it was Pfizer, because uh, I've been ranting about Pfizer for some time, and we can come back to Pfizer when we talk about financialization. If they decide to do a massive share buyback scheme, own up to it. You don't have to rubber stamp that it was given to you by a consultant, right? So in the business sector, what's been interesting is that that same presence of consultants, it's interesting to ask why. Mm. You know, sometimes these are very young, you know, smart young people maybe doing an English degree at Oxford or middle, medieval history at <laughs> Harvard, going in and advising IBM on their value chains. It's like, well, watch out, IBM. <laughs> but are the, is the CEO in IBM really so stupid? No. It might just be convenient to have that rubber stamp, right? And in the public sector, the fact that we blame the public sector for everything, as soon as a civil servant makes a mistake, front page of the Daily Mail, whereas venture capitalists and entrepreneurs are allowed to make mistakes and brag about it, there's a lot of risk averseness in the public sector. So being able to rubber stamp, oh, 
it was McKinsey that told us to do that. I want to talk about that in a second, but just on, the, I guess, the con part of this, you know, are these people, they're not, they're obviously not stupid, right? They're incredibly well-educated people. Are the consultants coming in, you know, they're not just bullshit artists, they're intelligent people. Well, or maybe they are, no, no, raise no. your eyebrow there, but you know, they're, they're intelligent people. <laughs> they're intelligent people, you know, is it, is it a confidence trick? You know, yeah. looking at the track record, you look at, for example, you say test and trace, that's an expensive mistake, right? Yeah, yeah. but so was G4S. Yeah. I mean, do you remember what happened? The military had yeah. to come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the London Olympics hired G4S. It's a different type of outsourcing. We actually cover it in the beginning. We focus on the large consulting companies, but we look at it in the context of a wider trend of privatization, outsourcing, and then this consultification. They're all kind of related but different. You might remember that the London Olympics uh, was the security was outsourced to the private sector, specifically to G4S, that failed massively, just like Serco has failed massively in our prison system. They are not experts at delivering kind of public value, and we should remember prisons are also supposed to be good for prisoners. We shouldn't end up with lots of prisoners dead, uh, committing suicide, and so on. So what's interesting is that these failures have actually gone um, unaccountable. And so your question, are they just con artists or are the governments hiring them stupid? You know, it's a good question. It's a very good question. I think the answer is just a, a you know, very, com well, I don't wanna say complex, but we need to kind of go into it. Um, the young people going into consulting, because we actually talked to a lot of them, and if you look at what's happening on Twitter, especially after, I don't know if you've seen the reviews, so the book's just out today, mm -hmm. but for two or three weeks now it's been reviewed, and it's really interesting to see the commentary underneath the Financial Times uh, uh, profile that came out on the book, because um, there's lots of consultants saying they agree, there's lots of private sector people saying that they agree. I've gotten lots of WhatsApp messages from politicians <laughs> saying they agree. So then it's like, all right, so why are we constantly uh, you know, in this mess? And I think there's a great disillusionment within the young people working in consulting companies because you know, they, just like when they go into government or consulting or even into Goldman Sachs and Google, God forbid, they're still trying to do good. I mean, I know I've got four kids. They all really care about climate, all their friends do. Um, so it's not that they go into McKinsey because they want to screw someone over. Um, but they do go in perhaps thinking, you know, we want to do good. These are complex challenges and McKinsey or Deloitte or PwC will be part of a solution. And then the kind of dysfunctionalities we talk about in the book are resonant to them, that you're actually part of the problem, not part of the solution. And then the senior management, I mean, some of the stuff we talk about is um, lowballing, right? So that you're in the room for free for free. I experienced this in Italy where I was uh, uh, tried to help the government during COVID and there was all these McKinsey folks in the room like, what are you doing here? Um, and I was told by a particular minister, don't worry, Mariana, they're just helping us and, and oh, they're working for free. I'm like, really? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> like, there's 13 of them. <laughs> um, like, who opened the door? So they're in there for free, yeah. Um, taking notes, making government more efficient. Maybe there's not enough civil servants, you know, in the government and you're you know, this particular minister actually came from the private sector. I was like, come on, we, we need to move quickly. And they know how to do PowerPoint. They know how to organize a meeting, chairing at minutes. And that means the report will be done in a speedier way, which is probably true because we have had a decimation of the public sector. I mean, this is kind of the self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. But lo and behold, some of the contracts that then came, you know, in from these recovery programs were handed out to McKinsey. Um, and we, and it's not just McKinsey, by the way, I keep using them because it's so easy just to choose one name, but there's lots, you know, we talk about the six, the big six, um, but coming back to that issue of the self-fulfilling prophecy, what we look at is that the history of capitalism is the history of consulting in recent years. Why? With the huge waves of austerity, if we want to use that word, in places like the UK, but even that slower kind of bashing <laughs> at the state that at best it can fix market failures, or you know, at best you can steer the ship but don't row, that's for the, the private sector. Well, if you're not doing, you're not learning by doing. You, in fact, start withering away your ability to learn, your ability to be flexible and agile, and there's no challenge out there, whether it's climate, health, digital, and so on, that can be tackled without all these different actors, public, private, third sector. So the public bit is getting weaker and weaker, and then getting addicted, almost like a drug, to the consultants. And the consultants have a business model where they need those clients over and over again. So they don't actually have an incentive to make that actor stronger. 
It's a really uh, interesting quote from during COVID. I think it was in the British government where civil servants were complaining about getting these sort of zombie emails from consultants. Yeah, we we'll like, talk about that. Really, really basic information. But can we, if yes. we just, <laughs> if we just talk about... Um, in fact, the Deloitte uh, test and trace one. Yeah. You had people uh, in the UK government saying this is ridiculous. We gave them the test and trace contact. They had no clue and were sending us these ridiculous zombie emails. Mm. Um, let's talk about risk aversion and sort of outsourcing that risk aversion. I don't know, you're in, you're in government and you go, we're going to outsource this to McKinsey or because you, we've kept mentioning their name, any of the other big firms. Um, Bain, but, yeah. CCG. But if you don't, if you don't uh, interrogate the context that that's happening in, i.e. whether it's a, sort of the media climate that the public sector is terrified of basically getting torn apart on the front pages, mm. you know, we can sort of, let's say, cleanse the parasite from the system or, you know, diverge consultants from the public sector. Mm -hmm. But unless you actually, you know, interrogate that context, we're not going to suddenly induce a magical sense of dynamism in the public sector if yeah. people are still terrified of, yeah. of taking on the yeah, risk. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I set up this, uh, actually it's, it's a department, it's not just an institute called the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. You know, Che Guevara, uh, great smart guy, once said, um, we need not just better policy, we need a new man, a new woman, a new way of thinking, a new mindset, right? So the reason I set up the institute was that you can't just have a better policy, you literally need also new training, a new way of thinking within the civil service. So we've rewritten the whole curriculum Currently, the curriculum, whether it's at Oxford, at Harvard, you know, at some of these top uh, schools of government, like the Kennedy School, Blavatnik. Oh, God, now my friend who runs Blavatnik won't like me. But anyway, um, they're still <laughs> driven by the traditional approach, uh, new public management, public choice theory. It's basically how the curriculum is designed. So we say, no, if you're at the center of the system, if you're co-creating value, not just redistributing it, if you're co-shaping markets, not just fixing them, what do you need to know? You need to start having really smart, outcomes-oriented tools. What we did, by the way, with COVID, when it was too late, millions of people were dying globally, outcomes-oriented procurement that was used for the vaccine, that comes from a wartime scenario. So the Defense Production Procurement Act in the US came from the Korean War, where they had to very quickly, uh, just like in all wartime scenarios, transform the automobile industry, for example, to produce wartime goods. That's because they want to win the war because they're serious. When we go to war, unfortunately, we're living through a war. Money comes out of thin air, by the way, in wars all the time. You know, all of a sudden, money that we were told before, there wasn't enough money for education and health for war. There's money. But also the tools that are used for war are, tend to be much more strategic. The relationship between the public and the private sector tends to be more strategic because it's outcomes oriented. As soon as it's a societal problem, health, education, transport, the digital divide, we have all of a sudden less money there's trade-offs. You spend more there, you got to spend less there. So the intergovernmental approach that you need to fight a COVID pandemic, where we had the COVID war rooms with ministers from all over working together, we should normalize that. And the problem is that we've convinced ourselves by thinking that at best we can fix markets. We just have very siloed government structures. You have the Department of Health, Department of Energy, the Treasury, not really working together in that war room kind of way. And I don't like the image of war. We shouldn't be thinking of war. And yet, we only do it with war. So that kind of slow decimation of the public sector, which has also created a very siloed, bureaucratic, sometimes inertial public sector, is, is what I think we need to combat in the first instance. As soon as you have a more capable, uh, creative, dynamic, funky, uh, a bureaucracy, a sexy bureaucracy, if you can say that, it's also going to be more interesting to work in government. Mm. So by saying that government is at best a lender of last resort versus an investor of first resort, at best a de-risker instead of a taker of risk alongside others, um, then of course it's going to be more interesting to work in Google, Goldman Sachs, McKinsey, and so on. So that's something I've been very wed to since I wrote the book, The Entrepreneurial State, that we need to admit that we need entrepreneurship everywhere and we need entrepreneurial ecosystems. When Kennedy, for the Apollo mission, which I wrote about a mission economy, said we're gonna do it because it's hard, not because it's easy, that means you have to embrace uncertainty. You have to embrace experimentation. You have to get a lot of different actors. There was 400,000 people that helped us get to the moon. The contracts were designed in very ambitious ways to stimulate lots of bottom-up innovation that got us camera phones, uh, baby formula, software, if you've seen the movie Hidden Figures. Um, we don't do that with our social challenges, with the sustainable development goals. We don't treat them seriously. Mm.
the other big news event today, other than your book coming oh. out, is uh, Keir Starmer gave yeah. a speech where he sort of announced his five national missions, yeah. which sounded a little bit familiar. I want to come to that in a moment. Um, there's one other example in the big con. Would you talk about um, Puerto Rico a little bit? Because the sort of the, 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 the consultants that sort of got rolled into there, it was a, it's an interesting example, I think. Yeah, I mean, can we talk about the cure? Yeah, thing? Of okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Now you got me thinking about yeah, that. Yeah, no, shoot. Um, I mean, first of all, you know, whether it's in Puerto Rico or many other parts, also of I don't like the term, but let's just call it the global south. So countries that have actually been experiencing uh, development challenges that have that are not a coincidence. They've been designed. Uh, what do I mean by that? The conditions attached to loan programs in many developing countries have been conditional on those countries actually reducing the amount of money they're spending in their infrastructure, in their health systems, and so on. So instead of strengthening them, the finances come with very problematic conditionalities that have reduced the fiscal space. And when that happens, you all of a sudden need someone else to help you because you literally don't have the capacity the capabilities, but also the resources. So there's also been this very problematic um, symbiosis in some ways between the weaker fiscal space in countries like Puerto Rico and the need for others to help you because you are reducing your ability, your capacity um, to govern. And when it's also based on um, misery, you know, I mean, when you also have climate symptoms, you know, global warming, which is having a greater effect in countries. I was just talking the other day to the Prime Minister of Barbados, who's very active on the climate front, the name Caribbean. Drop. Sorry? Name drop, I said. Oh, we're working very closely, actually, so I can, I can properly name drop her. I don't have to pretend. <laughs> actually, I can name drop the Pope, who I met this. Uh, I even have a picture. Oh, look at it on Twitter. I just tweeted it. Yeah. Uh, he was reading Mission Economy on Monday. Sorry, <laughs> this is so much fun. I can actually, I don't know when this is going out. Will Monday mean anything? Yeah. Uh, anyway, Same. but yeah, so I think it, I think the reason that, for example, the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, who's currently really driving what's called the Bridgetown Initiative, which is rethinking global finance, and really she talks about the double jeopardy, where countries like Puerto Rico, Barbados are facing the symptoms of global warming, which was caused by the global north. So they're getting, they're being kind of, can we swear a bit? Screwed on that side. Yeah, of course we can, yeah. <laughs> and then the other side, that they're getting messed about on is how the global financial architecture isn't then allowing them to face head on, to invest head on, on both climate adaptation and mitigation especially. And so the loss and damage fund, which he's helped to kind of set up since COP27, which is enabling uh, developing countries to have the resource to face those challenges, but also then to redesign the global financial architecture so we stop having those very problematic conditionalities. That's just a huge issue, which will take us. But anyway, yeah, so Keir, I mean, I've been talking to the Labour Party now for, for a long, long time, over a decade, and it's really nice to see that it's finally, how do you say, what's the word? Landing. Yeah. I do think, just, I always say it's not enough to talk the mm -hmm. talk, you need to walk the talk, but also it's the how. So the mission-oriented approach for me is something very specific, it's not just a word. And so we need to see how much is being learned from that. What missions are in the book I wrote, Mission Economy, is um, coming back to the moon landing, the challenge at the time was like the space race, beat the Russians, but that wouldn't have gotten them anywhere. Mm. It had to be getting to the moon and back in a short amount of time. It's very specific. You can actually answer, did you achieve it? Mm. Some people say it never happened. It was a conspiracy, but let's just assume. I thought you should say that, <laughs> <I know>. actually. <laughs> so did they get to the moon and back in a short amount of time? Yes. With the Sustainable Development Goals, each and every one of them, 17 of them, are actually broad challenges. Turning them into concrete moonshots, next step, that require many sectors. Getting to the moon was not just aerospace, it was nutrition, materials, electronics, software, and it required government instruments from procurement, but today it would be grants, loans, and so on, to foster that bottom-up experimentation in the business community and other organizations towards the goal. So that's the idea. You start with the challenge, can't we think that? They're the 17 SDGs. We can negotiate what they mean locally, like in a city in London, it would include zero knife crime amongst our young. Huge, huge, huge problem in London. Zero, that's the goal, yeah. right? Across many different sectors. 
and then transform all the instruments, industrial strategy, procurement, how we do budgeting to really foster that bottom-up innovation towards the goal. So I'm very curious to see how Keir Starmer's missions can translate into this kind of cross-sectoral industrial strategy, bottom-up experimentation towards a goal, which then means a very specific relationship with the business. No more freebies, no more subsidies and guarantees, you know, EasyJet getting 600 million, no conditions attached. Uh-uh. <laughs> uh, in France during COVID, both Renault and Air France got support with conditions attached because they had a mission around green. Uh, in Germany, the steel sector got a huge loan, but because they had the Energiewende challenge, it was conditional on steel lowering its material content, which they did across the whole supply chain, repurpose, reuse, recycle. That's not how we do it in the UK. And I've been worried in the past from labor just talking about the need to be business friendly in order to prove that they were serious about the economy. That's a great recipe to not work very well. No one has to be friendly to the other. You just need to be dynamic, again, symbiotic, have collective intelligence towards a goal, but it's not about being friendly. It's about, you know, let's get a deal that truly symbolizes collaboration, co-investment, risk sharing, and reward sharing, as opposed to socializing the risk and privatizing the rewards. I guess that you sort of answered my next question, which was <laughs> going to be about how, you know, the it's, it's one thing to say, it's another thing to do it. And, yeah. you know, the ideas you advocate over the course of your work are pretty radical, quite progressive, and would involve overhauling capitalism in quite a significant way. And just yeah. saying, mm. these are my missions, or, and it's not just, yeah. I want to be clear, it's not just the Labour Party either, you know, because right. Dominic Cummings had a big thing about like moonshots and like, you know, we're going to become like a big, basically mm. turn the whole government into DARPA, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, it's more broad than that, isn't it? It's like, you can't just, you can't just say we're going to have these missions. You actually, you have to follow through on it. I guess that's an open question. Yeah, and uh, Dominic Cummings brought me into Downing Street before he, you know, before all that blew up. Uh, saying, loved your book. <laughs> and, and he was talking about the entrepreneurial state. Mission uh, Economy was just coming out. Okay. And I was like, well, if you do, you got to stop talking the way you do. Because to be honest, you got some issues there. I mean, his thing was like, like, oh, we need geeks in government. I was like, you think NASA attracted the people they did? The average age was 26 years old in mission control room saying, oh, we need geeks. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they got real experts who were honored to work in NASA because of the moon landing. How does DARPA attract to the kind of talent they have? Because they've been at the center of the economy. DARPA, you know, everything in your iPhone or any smartphone that's smart and not stupid, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri, was all government financed. When um, Obama, after the financial crisis, had an 800 billion stimulus program and decided for it to be green directed, he was able to attract a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Steve Chu, Chinese American to run the Department of Energy, not because he said, oh, can someone help us de-risk Elon Musk <laughs> or do a carbon tax or fix markets in the energy sector. It was like, you know what, 800 billion, we're gonna green direct it. I was like, I'll be there. You know, so you have a Nobel Prize winning physicist who's like, that's, that's great, let's, let's try to do that together. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to leave Stanford and come in. So the real question is not so much bringing geeks into government, it's admitting that growth is not just a rate but a direction and we have to be ambitious on the direction. If it's gonna be inclusive and sustainable, that means we're gonna to have to change a lot of things. And it's exciting. It's exciting to be part of a government that has a strategy, has a vision. It doesn't mean everything's gonna be perfect. Of course it's not. Actually, the more you have a vision and vision, the more you're gonna make mistakes. Um, and the problem really is we don't have enough strategic visionary uh, governments today, and it's not because people in government are stupid, it's there's so much fear because there's so much ideology. As soon as you make a mistake, front page of the Daily Mail. Um, you're supposed to you know, set the horizontal conditions and get out of the way. Missions are about the verticals, mm -hmm. but not the verticals in terms of the sector that you're gonna give a lot of money to, the picking winners problem. It's what are the challenges you're gonna go after and how can you use every tool you have in government to kind of help really create and catalyze that collective intelligence across the economy. And what the book, The Big Con, talks about is that capacity, that capability, that savoir-faire, um, sapere so fare, it sounds better in Italian, um, it has been lost slowly over the last years because of the lack of insourcing of the capacity, this outsourcing that we've had, and the consulting industry has benefited massively from that. Notwithstanding uh, the Pope and Dominic Cummings, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you've worked, you've yeah. worked with several other governments. I'm just wondering, over the course of that time, what are some of the biggest 
myths or orthodoxies that you've encountered and felt the need to challenge or change during that time? So, well, it's, I mean, one of the things we say in the book is that it's sort of counterintuitive. You would have thought that it was just kind of a conservative-led government that would have paved the way towards consultants. We actually say it was kind of new labor, for example, and the new labor-ish kind of idea that, oh, yeah, of course we need government. It's not the Thatcherite Reaganite view, but at best what we're thinking about is an efficient government, a government that's going to be responsible with its money, and we need cost-benefit analysis, net present value. We're actually... Had anyone done a net present value calculation on the moon landing, never would they have even begun, <laughs> right? So, so many of the difficult challenges we have need to be purpose oriented. We need metrics like the BBC has around public value. You know, and public value within the BBC is just really interesting. I've never actually really encountered any other public organization that is as rigorous or tries to be as rigorous as the BBC has with that concept and public interest tests and so on. But that should be the conversation. And I think as soon as, you know, coming to your question, if there's this ideology that on the progressive side, at best you can fix markets, on the conservative side, get out of the way, um, then they're equally problems. And one is just a very clear problem because without government, it's going to be impossible. But if at best government is there to fix market failures, then it's, it's, it's also a problem. And I think that's the problem that I've been tackling the most because I think usually when you have adults in the room, we can get rid of that kind of ultra-conservative idea that government's not needed. But if at best it's there as putting patches, filling the gap, if public space is just filling the gap of where private space is not, you're not going to get a very nice piazza. <laughs> we, uh, we started with a broad question, so let's finish with one as well. What, what gives you hope? Uh, young people. Um, I actually think Fridays for the Future was and continues to potentially be a really radical um, uh, force for good. I think the labor movement, which isn't necessarily the existing structure of labor unions, which themselves have to rethink a bit of their governance, give me hope. We wouldn't have the weekend. What's today? Thursday. Thursday. So in two days, we two have days a Saturday. To go. How cool is having a Choo -choo. Saturday and yeah. Sunday? People died for that. Yeah. We didn't just have the weekend come down from heaven or, or from governments. People fought for the weekend. People fought to have vacation. People fought to not have kids working in factories. That gives me hope. Because it's like, that's why this system is kind of bearable. It's not a good system, but it was people who fought to make the system better. And that just gives me hope because it makes us remember that there's agency. There's nothing that's inevitable. Even those you know, $6 trillion of uh, share buybacks that we've seen in the corporate sector, that's not inevitable. That's fruit of a decision. So that means that strategy matters. You just reminded me that I said we would talk about financialization and we oh, haven't done that yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That's the end. Um, no, just, okay, finally then. You, we, we've been talking very in quite, quite significant detail about capitalism and the capitalist yeah. system. And yeah. it's quite striking to me that in response to asking about what gives you hope, you've spoken about trade unions, right? And you know, Labor union. movement, movements, social movements. So Fridays for the Future is a movement amongst students um, of different ages, actually, from high school, college, and so on. Well, mainly high school, actually, on, on Fridays. Uh, it started from Greta, but it became a global movement. Uh, the green movement, the labor movement. One of the challenges I would give to labor unions is, are you still a movement. <laughs> um, and so, for example, if you're not on an organizing drive and getting workers that are a bit less um, traditional in traditional industries, then you're no longer a movement. Um, so, you know, it's kind of pushing on the frontier. And um, what else gives me hope? Yeah, I mean, just I do think that as soon as you start to remember that so many of the good things that we have, people fought for them and that that fight was worth the fight is always going to give you energy to continue that battle. Mariana Matsukato, The Big Con, out now. Thanks Thank so you much. so much for Thank taking you. the time. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much.